Certainly! It has indeed been a day of suffering! Today on Lock Horns, an essential albums debate on the best records of early death metal. Welcome to Lock Horns Banger TV's live weekly de metal metal show, coming straight to you from the Banger Bar at Banger uh, Films. If you are joining us in the archive, you remember that this is indeed a live show. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. We're trying to meet the 100,000 subscriber mark. Well. This is a show that a lot of you have been clamoring for, and so have I, for that matter. We're digging into death metal, and more specifically, this week is all about the top 10 essential albums of early death metal. And tell me understand what is early death metal and what those albums are. The return of the metal comedian, Blaine Smith. Thanks for having me. How are you, man? Not too shabby. It's only been two weeks. Yes. So, you know, what have you been eating? What have you been doing since uh, I the, saw you? Whatever you guys leave on the floor, you know? <laughs> I go into the air vents when you're at work. I come out, I scurry around. You're going to have to fumigate the whole building to get me out now. That's good. That's good to hear. I have plenty of crumbs for yes. everybody. Listen, uh, how'd you get into death metal? Death metal, I mean, I think it's just, if you're gonna listen to metal, it's the, you're eventually gonna wind up there. It's the metalist of the metals, right. you know? It's the, if you really like metal, you wanna see it taken to the limit, taken to the extreme, and yeah. that's pretty much what death metal's kind of focusing on. But it's not for everyone, right? Often that guttural vocal yes. is like the ultimate line in the sand. People love melodic metal with the soaring vocals, yeah. but you get into that guttural vocal territory, it's not for everybody. So why do you like the, the, the metal with that vocal style? Well, I think, uh, you know, you don't need to get that guttural to still be listening to death metal. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of bands still kind of have, you know, a bit of a higher tone or will have like two tones at the same time. There's, right. you know, I think a lot of the, 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 you know, the kind of two biggest kind of publicized uh, low style, but, you know, there's still a lot of screaming in there. There's still yeah. a lot of, you know, emotion, anger, right. frustration right. that's really coming through that can kind of really connect with you. Doesn't need to be super low yeah. uh, cookie monster yeah. style yeah. to be death metal. There you go. Cookie monster has already come yes. up in the episode. That's a good <laughs> sign. So. This is about you guys, not just about us. We want to hear what you have to say about early death metal. So I want to give a shout out to everyone that's joining us from around the world. Here we go. We got people from Belgium, Colombia, Denmark, Ecuador, Finland, Germany, Lithuania, Mexico, Norway, Slovakia, Venezuela. And in the US of A, we got folks from San Fran, uh, New York, Cleveland, Boston, Fresno, Miami, Milwaukee, Fargo, and Worcester. And Canadians in Toronto, where we are, Dresden, Calgary, Fort McMurray, and my old hometown, the home of the nearly wed, or the nearly dead, newly wed, nearly dead, Victoria, BC. So there you go. All corners, just about, of this fine nation. And also joining us just a few steps away, Lisa Latasur. I'm here all week. How are you? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> a few notes for people in the chat. Those records have not automatically made it. We just brought them in because Sam likes to show off his vinyl collection. That's right. It's all about me, as <laughs> usual. <laughs> Which uh, is why I have can't this. Can't <laughs> really uh, help myself. Okay, so I think we got to lay some ground rules here because we've kind of chosen an, a kind of arbitrary title for this week's show because there is so much death metal we could talk about. So early death metal, basically what that means for all of you out there is death metal from the 80s and from the 90s. That's the best kind of categorization we could come up with. And maybe on a future show, we'll look into the 2000s. Um, in your mind, Blaine, like what in general terms do you think characterizes the sound from this era we're talking about? I think one of the things is it's generally pretty experimental mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's this is when it kind of came to be. So, right. you know, at the start, you're still hearing all the thrash influences. 
and then you start having people being like, okay, well now we're playing death metal. What can death metal do? Where can I take death metal? How far can I take death metal? So you find a lot of different sounds, different styles coming in, and then you have almost universally uh, terrible production for a lot of it. <laughs> because death metal is really hard to record without computers. <laughs> it certainly was in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, terrible production, generally mixed with some pretty killer album art yes. though. Uh, you can see from some of the albums, we've only got room for five, so we chose five and put them up here, but certainly we're gonna get into the album art of death metal later. And I think an important mention in terms of like the evolution of metal, it's generally accepted that that death metal was an outgrowth of thrash, which of course was an outgrowth generally of com the combination of punk with the new wave of British heavy metal. But really, if you start looking at these albums that we've got up here today, these are definitely not thrash records. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, you know, even lower tunings. We're talking about even, we talked about the guttural vocal style. We're really kind of reaching into the lowest possible depths of the vocal range here. And also in terms of lyrical themes and album titles, we're getting into some gruesome territory. The macabre. <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer, you know, nuclear assault game <laughs> over and making political comments uh, about the state of the environment. It is death leprosy. Yes. So it's just that kind of, uh, dare I say, teenage obsession with all things gory and uh, disfiguring. So many words. My buddies and I used to sit around when we were teenagers and come up with as many gory words that ended in the sound shun as possible because we all wanted to kind of give Chuck Schuldiner uh, a run for his money. Okay. Put on the cover of your binders. That's exactly right. So we got some general uh, ground rules here, Lisa, but I understand I get to do the legend this week. Is yeah, this true? It's true. I mean, we basically pick and you guys have to live with it, right? That's what the legend is about, the immunity idol of Lockhorns. There you go. And this is your this is your thing. So yeah. you go first. I grew up on death metal, a huge fan. I mean, I, you know, dating myself here, but I was a teenager when a lot of these records came out. So I was actually there sort of on first impact, so to speak. Pretty tough choice, and generally there's going to be some debate around what we consider to be the legendary uh, album that kicked it all off, but for today's argument, I'm going with Death Scream Bloody Gore. Well, Death, of course, coming out of Florida, Chuck Schuldiner, rest in peace, the almighty leader of Death, an outgrowth of earlier versions of the lineup, uh, an outgrowth of other bands coming from that area, but really Scream Bloody Gore, in my mind, was the album released in 1987 that was a distinctly way heavier, way more brutal turn yeah. in in the sound of metal. What are your thoughts on that? Blake? Yeah, I mean, this was, you know, it's kind of similar. We had that Death Tube conversation, right? Yeah. You know, it's coming out of thrash. This was kind of the first album that crossed, got enough thrash out there and enough death in there where you felt like you were listening to a new genre. Right. They kind of crossed that line, you know, everything from the sound to just the beautiful, gorgeous cover art, the amazing logo, the logo. everything yeah. about it. Everything was classic. You had regurgitated guts, you had infernal <laughs> yeah. death, you had zombie ritual, evil dead. I mean, these are, you know, these were already classics for us uh, going back to the late 80s. So Lisa, what do people have to say about Scream Bloody Gore? Surprisingly, there's not the consensus that you might assume. Fair enough. Here we go. Uh, Menan Dedia says, I don't think there's any argument about who the legend is. Scream Bloody Gore is the first one. Chuck Schuldiner, may he rest in chaos and noise, is the godfather of death metal. Mario uh, Donizetti, if it wasn't for Scream Bloody Gore, I would never listen to death metal. It's a masterpiece. Uh, Matthew Levens is back. Scream Bloody Gore is a given. Raw, untamed, the sound of foreboding evil, pioneering and influential, but it isn't their best. Can we have more than one death record? I mean, I think there's merit to that yeah. argument, uh, particularly the album behind me, Death Leprosy, uh, a strong competitor. Here we go, Jose Luis Faria says, the legend for me must be Leprosy by Death. It perfected traditional death metal and is still to this day the Bible of the genre. It stood the test of time with masterpieces like Leprosy, Born Dead, and The Mighty Pull the Plug. Uh, rest in peace, Chuck. Love Open Casket, too, on that record. Uh, Matthew Thompson, Bloody Gore is overrated. Okay. 
Nick Ottaviano, welcome back. If Scream Bloody Gore isn't the legend, you guys need to disband Lockhorns altogether. We're still live, everything's still working, but if we're going up to 1999, then Death Symbolic needs to be included too for helping to shape progressive extreme metal, picking up from the prog metal sound of Dream Theater and blending it with Death's constantly evolving death metal sound. That's a good point. I mean, maybe we'll get, when we get to the 2000s, we need to think about symbolic maybe being a, a key transition. Anyway, Alexander uh, Van de Kavai butchered that in typical fashion. The death album I would like to see on the list is The Sound of Perseverance, ultimate balance between brutal death technicality and emotion, the most mature death metal album. Clearly a pretty impressive catalog. I mean, clearly people are agreeing on the band, they can't yes. agree on the album. I mean, so many great albums by this band, but give me your thoughts on those later death records. Well, I mean, and this is, you know, it's probably gonna come up a little later, f foreshadowing, but <laughs> I think uh, this one is the one you pick because it's it's not, we're not necessarily saying it's the best, but the most kind of important. Yeah. And then what I think would is, is a really fantastic record that no one's mentioned for some reason is Human as the first sure. death record to kind of start the transition to yeah. where they would ultimately go, where it's, uh, you know, it's more progressive, the lyrical themes are a little more mature, it's gone from the horror to more kind of introspective, kind of... Amazing play, Sean yeah. Reinhardt on drums, some incredible playing. You're right, it does mark a shift. Undoubtedly, Leprosy, a better sounding record. I would not dispute that. If you haven't heard the remastered version of this record, it fucking kicks ass. I wish they would do that with more of these early records. Um, and yes, tighter songwriting, etc. But you can't dispute this sort of raw beginnings. Uh, I mean, come on, Infernal Death, it kicks in, and what does it start with? Just like four screams <laughs> in a row by yeah, Chuck Schuldiner? It was just like, this is, you know, it was exciting. Everybody got excited about this record. Then that record came out and they're like, that's a great record. But this was, you know, this was where the excitement came from. We this heard this record and we heard the demos leading up to it. We were like, is that guy fucking human? <laughs> yeah, right. We were like, surely he's putting his voice through some kind of cave-like processor because uh, we couldn't believe our ears. So there you go. Some debate, but clearly some consensus that death is the band. I think we've got one more comment here. MMJ.DK says Scream Bloody Gore is more important, but Leprosy is better in terms of death metal. I mean, I don't think you'd really dispute yeah, that. This was a band that got more proficient as yeah. their albums uh, progressed. Yeah, Lisa. Maybe you need to write some names off to the side. Okay, <laughs> I like writing names off For to the future side. future consideration, just to keep track. Right, well, let's... let's. We're gonna have a lot of band names floating around very soon. Well, we got, we got, we, I mean, so far we've only got album titles by a single band. I think definitely Leprosy we've got here. In fact, I think we have, we've got a magnet for that matter. We'll just throw that right on top. Let's just put that off to the side because I think there's some dis d some debate around whether that's uh, whether that's an actual uh, the one that kicked it all off. I but, mean, death yeah. really made it difficult for us by not really ever releasing bad albums, which exactly. is very inconvenient when you're compiling a list like this. Yeah. And I, you know, I have times when Sound of Perseverance is my favorite death record, and then I have times where Leprosy is my yeah. favorite death record. So it just goes to show that this is a love-in. Yes, Lisa. <laughs> it is a love-in, and it is time to move that love around. Okay. Other groups here on Lockhorns. Okay, we're going to a clip. We got Luke LeMay. Is he going to chime in for us? Uh, we're moving on. We totally jumped over. How could we do that? Our we're, friend Luke LeMay from Gorga. We're not, we're not going to do that, are we? No, we're going to play the clip where he talks about his vote uh, going to Scream Bloody. Okay, Luke LeMay, Gorguts. Listen to this guy. Of course, I was totally into death metal, and from square one, I got my guitar because of Scream Bloody Gore. I said, I want to sing like Chuck, I want to play music like Chuck. I mean, he was my total hero. Yeah. yeah. And I even had the last two guitar made in the same shape as right. Stealth he's playing just to pay an ode or a yeah. tribute to his work. Yeah. And uh, so that's Scream, Scream Bloody Gore was because Possessed would have not get me to play guitar and sing. Right. But Chuck is the, he's the man, you know, for the, this sound and everything. Uh, the mighty Luke LeMay there of Gorguts. If you don't know this band, shame on you. Of course, they were our death in Canada, really. I mean, Considered Dead was uh, a classic and, you know, one of the few bands out of Canada that got signed to Roadrunner during that, uh, that death metal gold rush, if you will. Much respect uh, to Luke LeMay. Okay. Your turn, Blaine. Yes. And we're gonna really kind of 
open the doors here. Uh, yeah. Give us, give us uh, your guest pick. Okay, so now to, to preface this, I'm 30. So I wasn't around for all of this happening at the time. So the album that ended up getting me into death metal, which I feel is the same album that got a lot of younger people into death metal, was At The Gates, Slaughter of the Soul. Now, if you're freaking out on Clench Your Asshole, um, uh, it's, it's, I, it's an album that really, I think, has appealed to uh, uh, my generation a bit more than, than, than a lot of albums because, I mean, this album, when it came out, it didn't necessarily make the biggest waves when it first came out because it was almost like it was just too forward for that time. Exactly. And it took a while until someone, you know, kind of like me was sitting there being like, I really want, a, you know, this record. And I didn't realize I wanted this record, yeah. but this was the... You know, it's 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 death metal still. You know, it's melodic death metal, but you know, it it's uh, it's catchy. It's you can listen to it over and over again forever. Yeah. You know, the lyrical themes. You know, similar to Chuck when he got a little older. It's less you know brutal because it's gore. It's yeah. more brutal because it's like, what's my purpose in life? Yeah, society. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's uh, I think it's a really important because it marks uh, a really large shift in death metal that had a crazy huge influence huge still to influence. this day. Like there's 18 year olds getting ready to make an exact copy of exactly. this record right now. No apologies necessary. I want to say two things. One is, let me be clear, this is one of my top five all time favorite metal records. I think it's just about as close as you get to a perfect metal record. I wouldn't uh, dispute that. The second point I want to make is I think that that's sort of showing the breadth of the kinds of records we're tackling here. Yeah. I mean, we're, this is, there's an, there's an eight year span here. We've got 87 to 95, and it just shows how far the genre uh, traveled in that period of time. But we know there's gonna be some opinions out here, Lisa, right? So we're gonna go to the board? No, we're gonna go to a clip. Oh, we oh, love yeah. clips. For those of you who don't know, Sam loves this album so much. We did an entire documentary, Deep Dive, just on Slaughter of the Soul. It was a pilot for a show uh, that is yet to be made called Metal Evolution Albums. You can find it on our channel for free. And uh, here's a clip from that. Let's go. These guys are amazing. Not a you, had, you had a nose split after doing like Blind by Fear. Yeah, because he couldn't drop in. I did like way over 80 takes yeah. on Blind by Fear. Yeah, yeah, he could just had to get it to was like... an old tape recorder, so he couldn't yeah. punch in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you had to do the whole song. Yeah, I was like properly close to tears, and all the skin in my right hand had just started coming off. <laughs> I remember we were in the rehearsal place like at least five, yeah, four or five days a, a week, so I mean, mm. we were really serious. Yeah. yeah, we had to step up, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we didn't want to release a shit record. I can remember the feeling that we wanted yeah, it, to, like it to matter, yeah. you know, it had, yeah, yeah. it had to matter. I just got to give some butchered sweet. I was pretty much close to tears. <laughs> I love uh, that line. That, of course, is a, uh, Adrian Erlinson, a fantastic drummer from At The Gates. I mean, I, I'm... I'm not gonna go on about this record because I said before, it's just about as close as you can get to a perfect uh, extreme metal album in my opinion. So let's go to the board. Here we go, Slaughter of the Soul. Uh, Epic Games 01, fuck yeah, Slaughter of the Soul. Cheers to you, Blaine. You. Rob Naylor says, Slaughter of the Soul is pure death metal. It may have paved the way for mellow death, but it's still brutal as fuck. And the riffage is pure death metal. So important in the history of metal. Jonathan Selman at the gates Slaughter of the Soul. How many future bands did that influence? Way too many to count. Uh, Princess Scarlet, get this man out of here. Uh, Dischu, however, says Slaughter of the Soul is a great album, but I think it's more relevant to melodic death metal rather than old school death metal, but I can live with it being here. I mean, again, we're getting into this split. Yeah. I mean, Gothenburg and a lot of the European bands brought in that melodic element to just make things more enjoyable, but also more complicated. And lastly, Korgel, the exterminator. I have no problem with Slaughter of the Soul being on there. I think it deserves its spot. Oh, Thank you. That's you're great. less of a shit disturber than I gave you credit <laughs> yeah. for. <laughs> so just to be super clear one more time for those at the back, today's show is 1980s and 1990s. That's right. We wanted to be very clear about what early meant, and we didn't mean like early as in the earliest. We meant early as in 
of all time up to 2017. Yeah, and so if anything, split it in half. if anything, this episode's going to beg is is a part two where we tackle the 2000s, which of course we've got 17 years to work with. So uh, we'll definitely dig into that. Uh, okay, well there we go. We've got two records, maybe three. A lot of love for this record that really spans the gamut of what we could call early death metal, really the, the, the originator, and then arguably a, a real pivot album that switched, uh, that allowed death metal to reach more people and, and, and uh, expand the sound. But Lisa, there's other albums out there. There are, clearly. sometimes on the show I worry that the banger offices are gonna get like banged in by <laughs> angry people in the chat. Yeah. And those people today would all be carrying a torch and a Possess record. Okay, well there you go. Speaking of angry, let's talk about this album. Possess Seven Churches, released in 1985, I believe, really early for something that looked and sounded like this. Uh, one could argue that it didn't have as much influence as other records, but clearly uh, coming out of the Bay Area, of course, uh, Larry Lalonde and the rest of the guys creating a sound that was pretty brutal for its time. So let's go to the board and see what people are saying. Fabio Mainieri says, Possessed Seven Churches, 1985, needs to be discussed. It's a thrash album just because death metal didn't even exist at the time, okay? But it certainly already sounded like death metal, and to some, it's the first one. It influenced the first wave of death metal in the early 90s and predates death's debut. No dispute there. Agit2306 says, even Chuck would say Possessed is the legend. Maybe. Shane uh, Levesque says, Possessed Seven Churches is the legend. You guys are crazy. <laughs> but whatever, it's your show, I guess. That's right, it is our show. Uh, Gabrielle Fernandez, we need to get Possessed Seven Churches up there. The band's first demo called Death Metal came in 84, while Death was still known as Mantis. And even if they're kind of thrash, they absolutely had something uh, different in their sound, which is wha what we call death thrash nowadays. Death may be the first pure death metal band, but Possessed are death metal's godfathers. They're for death metal what Venom is for black metal. Good point. And Alexander uh, Vandekavai, the guy who I always butcher his last name, says Seven Churches is, is maybe the first death metal album, but I don't see it as the legend. The sound on that album is just not death metal enough. Blaine. A lot of different of a difference of opinions on, on Seven Churches. Yeah, I mean, this seems to be a thing that happens on the show where that's almost always the band that goes here. Up above, Where yeah. it's, eh, have they, um, you know, again, 1985, very forward for the time, very death metal -y, and even, and not just musically, I mean, this is when you start getting the, you know, the satanic influence. It starts with The Exorcist, you start, yeah. you know, horror movies are, of course, one of the most important things to the genre. Yep. Starts with The Exorcist, the whole thing really kind of set a great blueprint for death metal, but mm. did it ignite the kind of passion that... Yeah. that Death did, maybe just not as much. I think that's a good point. I mean, it's undoubtedly an important album. A bit of an island in the sense that it was it was really one album by Possessed that made any real impact. That's one. Don't think they had as big an influence nearly as this band. I mean, you can't even have that argument. And sound-wise, I don't know, it is... It, for me, it's always been kind of like a, a bit more of a thrash record with kind of black metal uh, aesthetic, if you will. It's like a little bit of venom laid on top of the Bay Area. I mean, we could argue till the cows come home, and we will. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> but certainly deserves to be on the board. Did someone say cow? <laughs> That's my cue! That's my That's my cue! That's the first time I think we've mentioned cow. <laughs> and the last on this show. Uh, it's not over. Sorry. It's not over. Okay, yeah. Hannes uh, Wiedenhofer says, to me, uh, Seven Churches is just a crappy produced mediocre thrash record. Ouch! I don't think death metal deserves to be badly produced thrash. I mean, there is a point there. Not the best sounding record for its time, uh, considering Rain and Blood came a year later. Wow. Princess Scarlet, as I said earlier, Seven Churches has too many thrash influences. Okay. Bit of a difference of opinion there. We'll leave it up here. So, so far we have three of ten essentials. Reminder that maybe Leprosy belongs there too. Wouldn't be the last time that one band has two uh, records uh, on the top ten list. But Lisa, we got more ground to cover, right? So much. So uh, one of the fun things about this show is that we do prepare. We get magnets printed. We ask people on Facebook. We have meetings. We try and figure out what you guys are going to want. 
And then we get curveballs once we open the live chat. Right. And we try and respond to that and make this show about what you guys want in the moment. Yeah. And they want to talk about Sepultura. Everyone wants to talk about Sepultura. Let me go to the board and then Blaine, I want to hear your hang, opinion. Hang on, let me let uh, pull it up. There you. we go, Sepultura, HR, the Fire Blades wielder. When you think about it, there isn't actually a huge difference between seven churches and schizophrenia. That's actually kind of a good point. Uh, fucking wasted, says Sepultura <laughs> is definitely death metal. Jason Vegan, Sepultura have been many genres during their career. Their early stuff had lots of death metal elements, uh, some black metal, but more of the extreme variety. Later stuff could be considered new metal. I mean. Every extreme metal genre we talk about on the show, Sepultura comes up. What yeah. do you think? Death metal? I mean, it's that thing, right, where if you're talking about glam metal, do you bring up Pantera because they had a couple of glam metal right, records, right? right? It's when you think of a band, the kind of what you think about with that band, I think, should be kind of where you're putting them. And did Sepultura have a very large influence? Are they a very large metal band? Undoubtedly. Yeah. Did Sepultura aggressively influence death metal? I don't really think so? Yeah, I mean, and also, uh, schizophrenia wouldn't be my choice. I would say maybe Morbid Visions or Bestial Devastation, the first two releases, I think there, there might be an argument for Morbid Visions being a death metal record, whether it deserves to be in the top 10 of all time of early death metal, not so sure, but no you know, dispute. I mean, they, they cover the gamut, Sepultura yeah, right. with Thrash, they were a bit of death, they were a bit of black. Eventually they influenced a lot of the, what became new metal. So a uh, tough one to debate. Lisa, are there more comments here? Yeah, and I think just as some things are generational, some things are geographical. We have a lot of people tuning in from Brazil and South America. Right. This is their band. Good point. Samir Jarouf says Sepultura's Morbid Visions is the true legend. Almost impossible to get worldwide famous in those years coming from Brazil. But we must, so we must give credit to that. Andrew Kazorowski says Morbid Visions was more proto death. So, I mean, maybe there's an argument here. So we'll say Sepultura, Morbid Visions. There was an earlier comment about schizophrenia, but for what it's worth, my personal opinion is that this is actually much more of a death metal record. Schizophrenia, a little bit more thrash. Would, what do you I mean, think? Again, it's just so hard. It's like, why? <laughs> I don't know. Here's 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 one more. I don't understand. Uh, before you guys, before we we'll move on, here, here here's one more. Here we go. Logan says Morbid Visions came out in '87. Yes, same year as Scream Bloody Gore, and they brought that sound to an international audience. Well, okay, I'd say there's a case being made here at Sepultura uh, that Morbid Visions belongs, but maybe we should move on, Lisa, because we could spend the whole hour. Talking about <laughs> In fact, we have. Well, we have done a show. I feel yeah. that we will definitely spend a lot of time on these next couple records because, uh, well, I've met you. <laughs> Here but we go. But also, uh, people want to talk about them in the chat. Okay. Here we go. No show is complete without talking about this record. Yes, I got the vinyl in the day. Uh, Entombed. Left hand path, let's go to the board first and then we'll talk about it with Blaine. Jason Vegan, I'd also put Entombed Left Hand Path on the list. It came out in 90 and influenced so many bands with the Swedish death metal sound. It's still influencing bands today. That classic Sunlight Studio sound. Screaming Oak, Left Hand Path, probably the most well known and praised Swedish old school death metal, maybe we could have, this should be go old school death metal, <laughs> with much grittier and hardcore influence sound compared to their American counterparts. And Matthew Levin says Left Hand Path comes crashing in like a tsunami of fuck yous. A uh, huge sounding monstrous and just damn ugly, utterly gripping, deeply infectious, like gonorrhea. Maybe the quote of the week. <laughs> Left Hand Path, what do you oh, think? Uh, I mean, for me, like I, I, you know, I put uh, At The Gates up because I thought it wasn't gonna get mentioned and that's what got me into death metal, but Entombed, I think, is maybe the best death metal record. Wow. Uh, it's, I mean, it's just so cool. Uh, like, the, I mean, it's probably the coolest album cover ever. Um, but yeah. then, you know, you have, you have the weird kind of experimentation on it. You have, you know, you're listening to a song and then suddenly the theme from Phantasm's coming yeah. in and that sounds amazing and goes so well with the record. Yep. You've got the you've got the crazy distinct guitar tone that everyone was like, wow, yep. how do I make that? What's that pedal? How do I do that? Yeah. 
Swedish Chainsaw Massacre. Amazing, yeah, that's great. amazing. Uh, and one of the fucking most brutal, <laughs> awesome back cover photos of all time, Daniel. I don't know if you get in on that. I used, to, I was like, I want to go there. I want I know, my right? own photo shoot there. <laughs> that was just so cool. Dead of Winter uh, with the black cross in the background. No doubt, distinctive sound, great artwork. Some of those sort of eerie orchestral kind of quasi horror film yeah. soundtrack moments, that real down tuned sound, left hand path, the title track, fuck, so heavy for its time, supposed to rot, so many great songs on that album. I don't think we're gonna get much argument against left hand path, Lisa. No, but I just screwed up the show because we were supposed to rewind and start back in the 80s and I just jumped right in there because Hey, it's a live show. 1990. Folks. What's it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to roll it back. We're going to okay. keep going with the 80s first. We want to really hear your 80s suggestions and then your 90s records. We'll get there. And uh, other than Possessed, this is the next one. Yeah. Here we go. Most, uh, Definitely. I, I would imagine that in a lot of viewers' eyes, Alters of Madness may, there may be an argument for Alters of Madness, in my opinion, to be the legend record. Obviously, it came out a couple of years later, but Alters of Madness, for its time, uh, was truly a masterpiece. And even listening to that album today, uh, it's quite remarkable what um, Trey and the boys pulled off. But let's go to the board. Uh, here we go. Alexander V, I'll just leave it at that. My <laughs> legend is Alters of Madness by Morbid Angel. If I had to explain to someone not familiar with death metal what it's all about, I would give them that album. Great, great point. Leonard Reimstein, here we go. The legend, Alters of Madness. Scream bloody gore might be where death metal begins, but this is where it reaches full potency. potency. Sandoval hammers the drums like Mike Tyson on meth, working a heavy bag, quote of the week. Mm -hmm. The guitars are a psychedelic blur of virtuoso, virtuoso riffing. Nobody was playing guitar like Trey at that time. The lyrics, a Lovecraftian nightmare, maze of torment, blasphemy, chapel of ghouls, are perfect examples of the band's ability to write songs that are equally complex and catchy. The only flaw in the record is that the band had never topped it. They really set the stakes high with this record. It was their, uh, their debut. Uh, Daniel Warnes, uh, Alters of Madness, is an easy shoe-in. When I first listened to it, it was like Slayer on crack, which is what I reckon death metal should sound like. That's great. Matthew Levin's Alters of Madness. This album doesn't give a shit. It kicks you in the genitals, screws up your homework, <laughs> and farts in your face. <laughs> this is good quotes this week. We need to do a whole whole show just on this record because like the hits keep on coming in yeah, the comments. Right. This whole show should just be called <laughs> Screwed Up My Homework. Uh, go. I'll just uh, Yeah, just uh, this is kind of, you know, I, for, again, a case for the legend because this is where death metal kind of comes into it. Uh, fuck you. I don't care how listenable I am. Yeah. I'm going to play as tech as I can. I'm going to push the limits of what I'm doing on guitar, what I'm doing on drums. Yep. I want to be the best at this. I want to show you I'm the best at this. I don't care how you feel about it. An amazing lyrical content tapping into kind of like occultish yeah. themes and Eastern mysticism and and Trey's riffs sort of had this swirling sort of progressive before we were even yeah. using really progressive, I think, within the context of extreme metal. Uh, a remarkable album and production you know, when I re-listened to it recently, it really kicks a lot of these yes, albums' yes, asses in terms yeah. of just the pure sonics of one the record. One of the few so, albums that sounds good from yeah, the time period. Uh, one of the true classics of extreme metal, no doubt. All right. Where do we go now? We have so much to do. We have and so we're much like, to we're do. We're like half an hour into the show. Uh, one more 80s band to talk about, and then Sam, you get your choice. Okay, here we go. Obituary, Slowly We Rot. I don't think we'll get much dispute there, although probably better obituary records out there. But here we go. Mikhail Lopez, obituary, slowly we rot. The vocals, the riffing, the down tuning, the heaviness, the vocals, everything that a classic death metal is represented here. Chad Harmon simply says, obituary bitches. Obitu <laughs> obituaries. Obituaries. <laughs> uh, uh, tell me about this record. Uh, this, I, I love these records beside each other because they're yeah. almost like the opposite. Whereas, yeah. you know, Morbid Angel, we're going to just go as hard as we can. Obituary, not as technically proficient. Obviously, it's still death metal. Obviously, they know what they're doing. But not as technically proficient, but like catchy, really yeah. catchy songs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this was kind of the first album to get that, you know, slowly rot the font, the obituary, Secrets of the Ooze. It was the first kind of like, ugh, just yeah. like... 
slimy, gross. Totally. Really kind of just, I, I don't want to say sludge because that's a genre, but sludge. Yeah. Sludge before sludge yeah. was sludge. Yeah. Two things I want to say about this record. One, the tempo, super slow, right? Like yeah. the Death Doom thing we talked about a couple weeks back. Borderline Death Doom, like that super low sound with, with the slow temples. And secondly, John Tardy's vocals. I mean, just incredible sound out of this guy. Yeah, that was, I mean, that's really what kind of created the perfect like mood of it for this, you know, just picking the perfect album cover for your album. Just something rotting, just something yep. just falling apart. In my opinion, I mean, no disrespect to Chuck. I mean, when it comes to like, just sort of, if you're gonna give someone like the iconic death metal vocal sound, I would probably hand them an obituary record. Arguably, and we'll debate about this, Cause of Death, probably a better album, but this obviously more foundational. Uh, Lisa, do we got more on obituary before we move on? We do, and no consensus, so I wouldn't say that that is a lock. Okay, let's go, metal shirt collectors, okay? <laughs> no, not solely we rot. World, uh, World, of Dem World Demise was much better put together album and actually had the theme. Corgal the Exterminator, obituary slowly we rot must be on the list. The first truly disgusting gutter death metal with real punk-fueled riffs. That's right, real simplicity uh, in the best possible way on this record. Uh, Necrovent says, slowly we rot, pretty much took death metal and fucked it in the <laughs> which is a good thing. Fairy Kim, they're picking the wrong albums by my favorite bands. Cause of Death will always be my favorite obituary record. Ross Johnson, obituary Cause of Death is their best. So, I mean, I kind of feel the same way, but it is, it's the same argument that Scream Bloody Gore is to yeah. leprosy. I mean, here we get a band like Death that is so important that it almost seems um, that they deserve two ra uh, albums, and that's not cash and delivery, people. That's <laughs> fucking cause of death uh, right there. Well, it's like, this is about influence, right? Yeah. Essential. If you were yeah. gonna yeah. make the playlist to give to your nephew or whatever, right? Which tricky. one of these would you put on tricky. it? Not the better technical record. I don't know, it's tricky. I mean, I would stick with Scream Bloody Gore just because it was the first. I might lean towards Cause of Death just because it, I don't know, it really crystallized that sound. It added James Murphy on guitar, who is, is a fucking fantastic player. Your opinion? I mean, again, right, it's, this, is the, this is the issue with when, if we're picking early death metal bands, there's no argument, it's very easy yeah. because you say obituary and everyone's like, fuck yeah. But when you say an album, suddenly it's, we're simultaneously arguing like, is it a better album? But then we're also arguing, what did the album do right. for people? Like, right. did the album have a bigger impact? Did it have a better sound? You yep. know, it's kind of two different points we're arguing almost, mm -hmm. where we could make two lists of like, early essential death metal albums by influence, early best death metal albums. Let's only yeah. one list. <laughs> Last word to our friend Nick Ottaviano. Ottaviano says, better obituary records for sure, but obituary really solidifies what death metal would become in the future with this record, presumably slowly we rot. Also said a lot of staples for the genre, including the Mora Sound sound. There we go. We'll leave it as slowly we rot, but we don't have a lot of time. We got more records to get to. If any strong opinions that cause of death is the more essential obituary album, chime in, don't get a lot of time. Lisa, what's next? Sam Choice. Me. I know, it's hot in here right now. But... It's, it's hot in here. <laughs> really tough choice for me. You know, uh, Altars of Madness probably would be my choice. Entomb Left Hand Path, a close second. But you know what? I wanted to pick an album that just in my opinion, you know, gets love within the underground, but I don't think gets as much love as being a really fantastic, Extreme Metal album, Pestilence, Consuming Impulse, released in 89. Uh, band hails from Netherlands slash Germany, got signed to Roadrunner. Uh, their predecessor, Malleus Maleficarum, was a fantastic album too, more thrashy. Oh man, Martin Van Drunen's vocals, so fantastic, of course, also from Asphyx. Uh, production, not the greatest production, certainly if you stack it up against <laughs> this mighty slab, but if you go back and listen to the riffs and listen to the ideas and listen to just the brutality on this album, Reduced to Ashes, uh, Out of the Body, The Trauma, uh, Chronic Infection, really fantastic album. What do you think, Blaine? 
Uh, I mean, this is a great band to be up here because I think out of everyone up here, this is the band that, I mean, are kind of the riff masteriest of yeah. them. Like, just the coolest, most interesting riffs out of anyone there, yeah. which, you know, who doesn't just want all the riffs that they can handle. So many good ideas, and I would argue that if it had the production of Altars of Madness, it might have made a bigger impact, because a lot of those riffs are kind of buried in yeah. a very kind of compressed uh, guitar sound. But anyway, let's go to the board, see if I have any friends left. <laughs> uh, Corgal the Exterminator, Consuming Impulse takes the athletic intensity of Slayer, it's true, more of a thrashy vibe in these guys than most of the, the Florida bands, uh, takes the athletic intensity of Slayer and blends the brutality of early death records, ants eating your face, the best of all worlds, <laughs> Samir Jaruf, crushing brutality fast and furious together with the shrieking lead work contrasting with interspersed melodic sessions and enticing breaks. Yeah, there's so many great transitions on this record, they really knew how to nail the tempo changes. Consuming Impulse must be on the chart. Uh, Mikhail Lopez, welcome back. The European answer to American death metal. Extremely well-crafted music, and it shows signs of the evolution they would have with uh, Spheres and, of course, Testimony of the Ancients, which came later more proggy. Uh, and Alexander V, I discovered Pestilence by Sam Shirt <laughs> on our previous Lock Horns, and I'm very grateful to it. Well, I'm glad you did. Again, I think it's, it's, it's a more overlooked record, and I don't think it should be. I think it, it deserves to be in the canon, uh, the all-time top 10. What's next? Quick, what do we do? Quick break for me to reassess what okay. the chat wants. Okay. And you guys to explain what happened between, say, 89 and 91. Like, we're about to shift into 90s bands here. Right. What did happen? Um, Anything? I mean, I guess you kind of starting to get the thrash out of there a bit more. Maybe, yeah. Uh, get the thrash out and kind of maybe get someone in, in the booth who knows what they're doing. To yeah, right, right. That sounds, yeah, for sure. I mean, good, I mean, there's 10 years that span these records and yeah. it's night and day. I mean, this, the we don't even bother talking about the production on this record. There's still bands today that try to sound like this and can't. Um, what happens, I don't know, I see, that's why I see this late 80s into early 90s period as kind of like phase yeah. one. Yeah, uh, mid 90s and, is kind of where you've established death metal and then you start getting your mellow, your progressive, your technical. That's your, right, yeah. that's right. And bands that have been, like by the mid 90s, death is like a prog yeah. death metal band. I mean, Entombed becomes this bluesy. <laughs> yeah, just kind of fun party completely band. Completely changes. <laughs> Obituary, of course, never changes fucking anything. Bless their souls. And Possessed, of course, uh, eventually disband. So I think that's maybe part of the reason that crystallizes this first period is because the bands that put their first records out in this era, by the time you get to the mid 90s, they've, they're either gone or yeah. they've shifted their sound. Uh, and they're not, they're not interested in just playing straight ahead death metal anymore. Yeah. That was a very meek cowbell because <laughs> I fucked up and jumped ahead again. I don't know why, I want to get to the 90s so badly myself. We uh, jumped over another great suggestion uh, from the past that came in, don't reveal it yet, uh, from one of our favorite YouTubers okay. who, who uh, showed up on an episode of Lockhorns and I said, buddy, get on the show. And so this is uh, the pick from Count Blagoroff. Go ahead, Count. My name is Sean. I'm from the YouTube channel Count Blagroth, and my pick for an essential early death metal album is Severed Survival by Autopsy. The reason why I picked Severed Survival as an essential death metal album is it was one of the first death metal albums to not only bring in a lot of groove, but it really took the groove and embraced it and slowed it down even further into borderline doom metal territories. And with that, they were able to create this absolutely putrid and disgusting atmosphere with the great dynamics of the frantic riffing and p barbaric pounding drums to the slower, disturbing, disgusting moments. The sloppy mix on this really adds to the atmosphere with an extremely loud bass, and the vocal delivery of Chris is absolutely top-notch with his delivery of these putrid lyrics sounding extremely genuine, like he is an unhinged psychopath. This album is a snuff film put to music, and that is why it is an essential death metal album, in my opinion. 
Nice to see some of our, of our viewers actually chiming in, put some, put some faces to these comments that I get abused with uh, <laughs> weekly. Autopsy, Severed Survival, we've got a few comments on it. Here we go, Horror Master, Severed Survival is also another legendary death metal album. You can almost say that they were inspired by thrash metal bands, but the vocals a change that completely go from 100 to over 9,000, okay? Matthew <laughs> Levin's Autopsy would be on my list as well. I know they sneaked into the Death Doom branch, but they belong there for Severed Survival or Mental Funeral. Uh, their second record, uh, Monguksul says, if autopsy gets mentioned, my day will be fulfilled. That's the least. Well, we got the magnet up there. I mean, we talked a lot about yeah. these guys. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really speaks to how good the record is that people listen to it with how terribly it's produced. Right. Uh, I hope you like bass, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I hope you're not a fan of drums. Because yeah. <laughs> well, you can't really hear that. Exactly. I mean, if you listen to this record, it's pretty sloppy. Yeah. But, you know, in hindsight, at the time, it was so brutal. Charred Remains, yeah. I read the lyrics from that song on, in Headbanger's Journey because it was like, the lyrics were like, it was like that Monty Python thing where like, how possibly absurdly yeah. brutal could we make these lyrics? And pretty sloppy, but there was almost like, it wasn't intentional, but there's a charm and there's kind of like a, there's something ominous about the sound of this album. And of course, uh, of course, great album art as well. But we gotta move on, Blaine. We don't have a lot of time. Okay. Lisa, where are we moving next? It is time for the real lock horns. This has been such a love-in. I've been saving this for you guys to get all like hot and sweaty and ready to fight about Cannibal Corpse. Okay, Cannibal Corpse, we're definitely into the 90s now. This is, yes. a, this is, this is a, a quintessential 90s cannibal, uh, uh, death metal band, of course, continuing to today. Amazing long career. Uh, here we go, Raphael Fireblade. Cannibal Corpse, butchered at birth, has to be here. And one of the legendary producers, Scott Burns' finest work in huge for Metal Blade Records at the time. Okay, so that's butchered at birth. Jason Vegan. Tomb of the Mutilated might be the best nominee for early Death Metal Essential album. Uh, Waniel Young, The Bleeding, <laughs> has to be it. It's basically a pop record as far as death metal is concerned. Every song is a standalone banger, and the intro riff to the album could be the soundtrack to Corpse Grinding. What a way to start an album. Korgel says Cannibal Corpse are the lowest common denominator <laughs> Disney death metal for children. <laughs> Under no circumstance do any of their albums belong on this list. Ooh, fucking wasted, says <laughs> Cannibal Corpse is McDonald's of death metal. Really blatant uh, ripping off of suffocation and malevolent creation. Corpse has no purpose but to be edgy gore for the sake of it. Some strong opinions. Uh, Cannibal Corpse, what do you think? Cannibal Corpse is one of those hard bands because, again, we're kind of getting into the essential for influence or essential for quality. Yeah. Cannibal Corpse, a band that, you know, they sold the most death metal records. They right. were, you know, their records got the most attention to death metal. They're certainly very important to the genre. At the same time, they didn't seem super concerned about making sure every album was good front to back or every album was good. Uh, <laughs> so it's a little hard to choose an album because there is an inconsistency to their stuff because they sort of found a template that they liked and just put records out, and then a parental group would freak out about it, and then they would sell, I don't know, no, 50,000 of them. No, good points for sure. I mean, in the chat leading up to the show today, there was a lot of love for Tomb of the Mutilated, so we have a magnet for it. But again, I would agree. Uh, it's almost like we got to have a Cannibal Corpse record up yeah. here. Otherwise, we haven't done our, our, our homework. But agreeing on what that record is is, is really ch it's not like left hand path or altars of madness uh with with those bands where it's like duh um so it's more like the band deserves to be there but yeah is there a standout record uh I, i'm not so sure lisa are there more comments there are and this is not the death metal band tree no this is the essential albums Treat. I mean, so if there's no one record that people can agree on, they don't make the list. Maybe it's not an essential album. Stranger things have happened. But let's go back to the board. Ricky Phillips, The Bleeding from Cannibal Corpse is essential. The production is there. Brutal and a few classics are here. The title track alone is worth an honorable mention. Uh, best of the Barnes era. Of course, there's the Barnes camp and the Corpse Grinder Fisher camp. Dischu, The Bleeding, okay, by Cannibal Corpse is legitimately a great death metal record. Garrett Chun, Cannibal Corpse Butchered at Birth. 
absolutely brutal title and artwork, creepy bios from serial killers inside the insert, last but not least guest vocals from Benton, I didn't even mention how badass the songs are, meat hook sodomy for one, delicious dishes, no cannibal corpse, just because you are popular doesn't make you essential. Boring and cookie cutter even at the time. Fairy Kim, respect to Cannibal Corpse for their gory album covers. Okay, J.A. Torres says, Cannibal Corpse has brutal album covers, LOL. That's pretty much it <laughs> and some good songs. Uh, Steve, Stefan Rogue says, Bolt Thrower is legendary, Cannibal Corpse is not. So I would say, I don't know, call me crazy, but based on two things. One, there's a lot of people that don't love this band, but maybe more importantly, there's no consensus on an essential album. So if there's no consensus on the essential album, even within the band's own catalog, how can you make it an essential album yeah. for the genre? I mean, it's you know, it's kind of one of those al those bands that isn't aging super well because yeah. now the the kind of extreme over the top violence is. It's almost comical, like, you know, you watch Rick and Morty or Super Jail and there's just as graphic stuff in there and that's, right. you know, f fun cartoons and, you know, you got Cannabis Corpse, Tube of the Resonated and stuff. Now right. it's kind of become this almost like a joke right. in, in with as time goes on, which kind yeah. of, again, makes it a little tri tricky. Well, and, you know, it's like being an artist is tricky and, you know, artists get beat up for evolving and changing the sound, but you can get beat up, up for, for staying yeah. the same. So you can't, you can't, can't please win. everyone. <laughs> but uh, speaking of not pleasing everyone, we should probably move on with the debate. Lisa, what are we, what yeah, are we doing? Yeah, I mean, normally we would go to the lightning round here. There's yes. a few things left to do a more deeper discussion on, and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. Okay. Because you guys have so many good comments this week. Here we go. This is a band that hasn't really got uh, brought up as much as I had thought yet, Deicide. Gabriel Fernandez, I didn't see anyone talk about Deicide. Their self-titled and Legion are both legendary death metal albums. Roy Robicho, my vote would be for Deicide's crushing debut. Chainsaw guitars from the Hoffman Brothers, bent and delivering vocals like a demon possessed by another demon. That's complicated. <laughs> uh, this one had it all, in my opinion, and spawned my enjoyment of the soothing sounds of death metal. Uh, Raphael Fireblade, Deicide's Legion must belong here. One of the first albums in the genre to add more technical riffing, definitely, and have really low guttural vocal style and vintage whine with an H like that. How is the first DSI not on this list, but Pestilence is. That's insane. We'll never fear vintage wine. You can stop whining. <laughs> uh, we've got DSI's debut there. So, Cannibal Corpse, way bigger band, but some more consensus on the album. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, they are the second biggest death metal band, I guess. Right. Um, so, um, the the demon possessed by another demon is a is a is a good way to talk about the vocals on the album because they did some weird production and you kind of have the this overlayered high and low that's really unique uh, and you know sounds really cool. Yep. Um, sucks that Glenn Benton is the Ted Nugent of death metal, but yeah. uh, but sometimes you can't argue with a good record, even if it's put out by a tool bag. Can't win them all, although David Vincent's wearing a cowboy hat now, so I don't know if he's the only Nugent uh, in the death metal crowd down there in Florida. But Lisa, we probably need to keep moving quickly. We don't have a lot of time, right? Keep Here we moving. go. Keep this Matthew train going. Levin says, Suffocation, Effigy of the Forgotten, a relentless barrage of crushingly destructive pestilence, claustrophobic and suffocating like waking up to discover you're in your coffin and buried alive. We're weird people yes. for liking this music. <laughs> uh, Yar da BM Mofo says, Suffocation's Effigy of the Forgotten needs to be on here because they were one of the first to bring in East Coast hardcore and hip hop to brutal death metal sound. Blame them for uh, <laughs> death core. Here we do have a magnet. What do yes. you think, Blaine? An essential um, album of early death metal? I mean, again, you know, the, the, the thing that kind of puts them up there is they did kind of do something really unique in the sense that Jesus Christ, that was a brutal goddamn album. They really, you know, right. because yeah. then you get your brutal death metal kind of a lot from them. It really is kind of the start of that where you're just, again, you know, really pushing, being like, how far can I go with death metal? How far can I take this? Right. And, like, really great album artwork yeah, as well. Really for sure. Make, 
And definitely representation from the East Coast, yeah. not being Florida, of course. Uh, I personally wasn't a huge Suffocation fan. Uh, don't know why, just wasn't. Uh, but certainly they have a strong fan base. But, I mean, we've got 10 up here, Lisa. I, just the question, is this going to be our 10? Well, not if the chat uh, is... Keeps chatting? Yeah, <laughs> because uh, we're not sure about Deicide. Okay, here we go. Uh, Mick Shazam, we're going back to Deicide because there's some debate. I've heard people talk about Deicide's Legion album as some sort of forward-thinking masterpiece, but I can't for the life of me figure out why. Sounds very plain, even for the time. Full disclosure, I'm not the biggest Deicide fan either. Never really got them uh, completely. Aaron Henry, yeah, I have nothing against Deicide, but they are also a bit boring. I think we can up with better albums. And Screaming Oak, I'd say Deicide almost goes towards the comical aura yeah. that surrounds Cannibal Corpse. I mean, that's a good point. Okay, I mean, rule. it's interesting. Why, again, you know, the second best-selling death metal, death metal band and their lead singer, bass player, is constantly in the news for right. doing dumb shit more than playing music. Right, right. So message maybe coming here from the audience, <laughs> like, focus on the music. Yeah, right. Focus on the music. Uh, okay, well, that opens a slot. Suffocation is still there. Cannibal Corpse and Deicide. Could you imagine? Neither of them are going to be a top <laughs> 10 essential uh, early death metal album, but... There's either no consensus on which album, or there's a feeling like uh, it's more of a, 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 a comical approach and maybe a bit too about the image or the self-presentation than it is about the actual music. Lisa, let's what's keep left? It go let's keep it going. Okay, Oscar Barroso. I think another album that pushed the boundaries of death metal would be Heartwork by Carcass. We all remember them as the pioneers of grindcore, gore grind, or whatever, but they really took death metal out of the park with that album by incorporating melodies and giving a perfect definition of what extreme metal is. Heartwork is essential. Tommy Smith, Heartwork was a game changer that influences metal to this day. Lizzie Williams says, None So Vile by Cryptopsy is my favorite death metal album. It was so far ahead of its time and was simultaneously brutal as fuck and pretty elegant in its lyrical and compositional <laughs> approach. Well put. And T. Shamehorn says, <laughs> if they don't put none so vile up there, I will slit their guts. So that might have to be, death metal maybe album. that's a death metal album. A lot of threats to us in, in the death metal album episode. <laughs> we did have an unso vile uh, magnet made. Uh, I believe this is 96. Yeah, that's getting a little later. Yeah. Uh, so it's definitely the one uh, you can, again, very technical band, Canadian, that's right, um, that is kind of really pushing the genre into more progressive territory. I mean, Heartwork, we should talk about Heartwork for a second. You could make the argument that this yeah. wouldn't exist if it wasn't yeah. for Heartwork. Like, if we're going to have Slaughter the Soul up there, and this is where we, I mean, we're probably going to have to have our 10 essential uh, <laughs> mellow death, death records, whatever, yeah. on which there will be this record and undoubtedly Heartwork too, but... I mean, if you step back, I would make the argument, if I may pull rank for a moment, which I love to do, uh, hard work, probably a more essential record than Cryptopsy None So Vile. What yeah. do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I feel like Cryptopsy is a, like, a bit more of a niche record, right? Yeah. Because you have to be really into death metal to be able to right. kind of go to that extreme. It's, right. it's you know, it's kind of uh, like almost like a uh, like a caviar of death metal where it's right. like it's uh, you know it's an acquired taste it's very rich <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and you know if you're a death metal connoisseur you're gonna love it but if you just play a cryptopsy record for someone you're gonna freak them the fuck out <laughs> heart box what the fuck am I doing heart work <laughs> Uh, it's getting hot in here, we're running out of time, and I can't spell. That says heart work, and if you can't read it, it's because you can't read it. Um, so, Lisa, what are we gonna do here? <laughs> I, I don't I, I'm know. like a deer caught in headlights here. A um, couple more ca comments, and then it's time to uh, make some decisions. Okay, let, we're getting down to it now. I think, I think suffocation is a maybe. Heart work is a maybe. Uh, none so vile is a maybe, and probably morbid visions is a maybe. As much as as much as I got these guys carved into my chest, I don't think we can afford to have two yeah. records by the same band because there's just so <laughs> many bands. Here we go, Rob Naylor. Only Pantera ever grooved harder than Bolt Thrower. 
one of the few bands who have never released a bad album. In battle, there is no law. Through Till Mercenary is an incredible run of brilliance. I know you're a big fan. Blaine, uh, Arthur Felipe Castana, Realms of Chaos by <laughs> Bolt Thrower made tabletop games sound awesome. And they also invented, uh, invaded death by putting doom sound that continued with the crusade and the mercenary. Vessel Brucchio says that uh, Bolt Thrower Warmaster, epic and groove laden. A lot of love for Bolt Thrower, but... Can we really agree on one of their albums being their best? We all seem to have our own favorite Bolt Thrower album, mine being Realm of Chaos. So a bit of a bit of a cannibal yeah. corpse syndrome. I mean, the, almost the exact opposite, where instead of not really focusing on a record, Bolt Thrower would only put out records when they thought they were amazing. Right. And if they don't have an amazing record, they won't put it out. Right. And yeah, and oh, you know, as a as simultaneously a, a death metal fan and a Warhammer player, and you know, I love <laughs> I love Bolt Thrower. Yeah, yeah, center of the center of the bolt uh, dartboard. Okay, Lisa, we got more. We're continuing. Oh, so Corgal says so uh, "Non So Vile" is a great record, but come on, the first Deicide is more influential. Jacob Corker's heart work has to be on the list. Without it, there'd be no at the gates. Okay. Zach Kaufman, the fact that Cannibal Corpse Tomb of the Mutilated isn't on the list takes all credibility away from this episode. Huge <laughs> fail. Not our first or our last, uh, motherfuckers. Uh, G Jimmy Purvis, Deicide's debut is a tonal masterpiece. One of the first death metal albums to have a real soundscape, and that soundscape is Hell. Uh, Jacob C.H., I think you can easily put every death album 91 on this list, but it has to contain Human. It is uh, one of the best and most influential uh, metal albums of all time. Death deserves two albums on the list. Man, we're not going to please anyone today. Uh, Thomas Rubel, please, uh, can we acknowledge Vital Remains? Let us pray. It needs to be there if Candle Course has mentioned that Vital Remains should be. I don't know. <laughs> Let's step back. Hard work, huge album, but yes. it's going to be in the in the melodic death metal uh, category as well. So we just got to make some room. Leprosy. I'm ruling out two albums by one band. Uh, I don't know if that's fair. None so vile. Maybe a bit more niche. Sepultura. Morbid visions. Man, that's tough. Obit as uh, cause of death. I don't think so. I'd almost be putting Deicide back in. I, I don't know if I'm going to sleep at night if we have Cannibal Corpse and Deicide not yeah. in the top 10 death I mean, I don't, again, you know, it's that thing where it's, you don't have to be the biggest Deicide fan to say that they had a big influence. Um, and I mean, I'm okay with At The Gates being removed if we're saying, oh, it has to be, or this or that. Right. Uh, you know, this was just for me, and I think for a lot of people, the first death metal album. It got me into it. And it's, yeah. it feels like it's out of place here, I think, but it's right. released in 95. Like, yeah. this, is not, this is not a late album. It's not like this came, it just sounds like it was released in 2004, right. so it almost feels like Because everyone place. else sounds like that No, band. like all the old school people want At The Gates gone. Yes. yes. But they're arguing with two fans who love this record. <laughs> and I'm, old, I'm as old school, look at me. I'm as old school <laughs> as they possibly get. I'm wearing a Voivod shirt for crying out loud. <laughs> Can't dispute the importance of. I mean, there is there is merit to the argument that this would belong in a different episode, yes. along with with hard work. So we could make room there. That I think what we're saying here is that this is really a list of pure death metal yeah. albums. This was the thing because we were like, are we doing old school or early? And we ended up settling on early. But this with this here, this just looks. This is old school. And uh, I mean. I'm fully okay with that. Okay, let's then I, I, I don't know. I mean, me being old school, but a guy who also like at the gates, imagine that is that morbid visions might belong more than none so vile. What's more influential? I'm not sure. Uh, we're not allowing two albums by one band, at least not today. <laughs> and just so everyone knows, like when we do uh, death metal albums part two, it's going to start in 2000. It's, That's right. We're not doing this all over from 94. That's right. So if you take out these albums from like 94, 95, they're not going to be. So is it really Cryptopsy? Time. Cryptopsy is regarded as having one of the most essential death metal albums of all time over Morbid Visions. I'm not so sure about I feel that. Like I, I, Morbid Visions, I feel like we almost need to toss to uh, people not from, because for us, it's hard right. to tell yeah. because Sepultura were like, oh, we had all these way more death metal bands. Right. But if you lived in South America, maybe that is true. Maybe but even a, for me, you know, kid from Western Canada, this album was way, had a way bigger impact on me than, than Cryptopsy None So Vile, but that's just me. What do we do, Lisa? Do we pull rank? 
Do we be those guys? Oh wait, hey, we someone, just you I just saw guys. a great comment. If my pick comes off, I uh, my second pick would be bolt thrower. <laughs> <laughs> Could toss bolt thrower in there. Ah, uh, man. It's, it's fallen to silence here because why? Because we're really conflicted. I'm pulling rank. I'm putting Sepultura, Morbid All Visions. Right. We're just going Sep, Morbid Visions. People like Cryptopsy, they don't want it to go away. People like Cryptopsy, they don't want it to go away. Look, guys, we're over the hour. We're well over the hour. We're just going to drag this out. You guys are going to stick around? Should. What are we doing? Oh, oh, we even got a magnet coming in from outside my man, Craig Mailman. Whoa. Clutch move. There's a um, little visions magnet. This uh, switch with Cryptopsy, maybe? I'd be down with that. Right. Suffocation off, Cryptopsy in. What are people saying? What Lisa's not even. I got to read the, the, the ticker tape now. I've given up. Boom, Morbid Vision <laughs> sucks. Uh, dude, yes, frig off, Sam. Yes, thank you very much. Bolt thrower, bolt thrower, Morbid Visions is fair. <laughs> what do people think? Fuck Cryptopsy. I mean, it's just like, it's just a. <laughs> It's a pissing match out yeah. there. Yeah. We're, we're, we're giving this some time. We're going to have to just call it a day. I think we're going to have to call it a day. Sometimes we have to call it. We're calling and, it a day. Uh, Cannibal Corpse fans, please direct your comments to uh, phone number 555-1212. Okay, normally we wrap up with comments about the future, but I think we've already touched on it. Clearly, we've got to do another episode. Yeah, that there's some There's some new gateways opening with albums like Heartwork and Slaughter of the Soul, and we haven't even got into the 2000s, so clearly there's probably two more episodes here. There's a melodic death metal episode, and there's a... Uh, a Y2K death metal <laughs> episode. Lisa, we done? We are done we're, for now. We're going to get out of here before it overheats. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thanks that for having fun. me. That right. was a lot of fun. You bet. Anytime. Uh, Lisa, Daniel, Craig, and Andrew, thanks for making it happen. Subscribe to the channel. If you like what you see, next week, I'm away. Going fishing, but here in the studio. p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. Thank you for joining us. Nothing gets more fun than this. See you next time. Bye for now.